You know, what I love about the Word of God is that it is both powerful and practical. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, we get into some very practical things uh, dealing with godliness and dealing with handling finances and handling money. And of course, Paul is telling this to Timothy as a pastor of a church, uh, being a good steward of things, but it's very applicable for us in our homes and how we are going to handle finances. Every household must learn how to manage money. You've got rent to pay, you've got food to buy, you've got other bills, and et cetera, and, and you've got to learn how to manage it. And unfortunately, we all know we've made bad decisions, we've made good decisions. But the reality that we face is, as a parent or even a pastor of a, of a church is that those under you are affected by the decisions that you make financially. And that's a, that can be a, a, a very scary thing. And sometimes we can get so caught up with personally this, this danger of making money and paying the bills and being stressed out and how is this going to happen that we forget as Christians God has given us the true riches, the greatest riches, and we end up devaluing those things and trying to evaluate and, 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 and elevate up the things of this world, and we really end up miserable. We really end up miserable, not at peace with God, just stressed and striving and just in that place. And the Word of God brings us back to such wonderful grace, wonderful pursuits that we want to see. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. He said, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moth and vermin, I like that, destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And he says later in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Like, in other words, God will take care of you as you seek his kingdom first and foremost. Having him as that priority in life. And so as we've gone through these house rules, we're at house rule number seven, and it's simply this. In this house, money isn't everything. And some may need to hear that because maybe gotten sidetracked a little bit. But look at his, his, the word here in chapter 6, uh, verse 1 and 2. Paul says, Let as many bondservants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. In other words, when we work hard as employers, it glorifies God. But when we are a bad witness and, and disrespectful to our supervisors, it really brings shame to the name of Christ. You know, people are looking for an opportunity to not believe in God. And I want to encourage you, don't give them an opportunity. Be a good example. Elevate your, your work to that right place as an honorable thing. Show them the gospel that you speak of. Verse 2, and those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. If your boss is a believer, it, it mean, doesn't mean that you get a, a free pass of work and neglecting responsibilities and such because, oh, he'll understand he's a Christian. And Paul says, no, that's not how it's supposed to be. Sometimes, you know, if, if people in working at the church or teachers that we would hire for the preschool, one of the questions that I would ask them is, why in the world do you want to work here? And, and sometimes people have a mentality that, oh, man, it's just heaven on earth, man. It's kumbayaville, and everything's just going to be wonderful. And, and though there are blessings, yes, it is still work. It's hard work. There are responsibilities that you have and spiritual attacks and things that are going to happen that, that are just going to go, what in the world are we doing? And, and, and yeah, there are wonderful blessings, but there's still that responsibility you have work to do. So let's get it done. Let's arrive on time and get to the work because the Lord ultimately deserves our best. And that's who we're serving. Our equality in Jesus doesn't eliminate God's order of authority. And in God's house, your work ethic matters. And when you're teaching your kids in your house, you need to teach them work ethic too that does matter to the Lord. He wants us to do our best because it, it's an example and a witness to others. So speaking of work and wages and a witness, how do we handle money of believers? Look at verse 3. 
Paul tells Timothy these four wonderful insights on handling finances. He says in verse 3, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, from such withdraw yourself. So, so number one, you might write this down and just say, he's telling them beware of misguided money motives from those who, are, who happen to be. And just like today, there were those in the church back here that were twisting the God's word and took advantage of others financially, just as there are those that even in a home that may manipulate things in order to gain uh, and get money. We know how Jesus feels about it. I mean, two times he went into the temple and, and flipped over tables because he, it was distracting and it was pulling people away from the pure worship of the Lord. And it was, a, it was a problem, definitely was a problem. It, it really ticked God off like nothing else. And Paul says four things about these guys to kind of note. And he says in verse four that they're, they're prideful. He is proud, motivated by selfish pride and not really a servant attitude, heart. They're on a power trip, he says in verse four there, that he's not only proud, he knows, knows nothing. He's obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. And so this, this person will take the gospel and tweak it to be some sort of a, a, a side doctrine or, or personal gain through it and, and uh, causing these problems. He says in verse 5 that they are the useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds. And what's interesting is that word wranglings, it has a picture of a scabbed up sheep that's rubbing against another sheep, causing an infection to spread. Kind of gross. Sorry to ruin your morning, but it's real. He talks about their personality at the end of verse 4 that says that these, these guys are full of envy, probably towards those who have a position or, or possessions. There's a strife. There's argument and division that they're causing. They're reviling and speaking evil and, uh, and such. And that's kind of what's going on. That really rotten to the core kind of things. And Paul is is telling Timothy to watch out for these men that would be like that in the church. It's a, it's a dangerous thing. And lastly, in verse uh, 5, he gives that purpose that they use ministry uh, for personal gain. And, and the gain can be, in context, finances, but the gain can be so many other things that take the place of the glory of God. Anything else. Some people preach for power over others, for positions, uh, to have some type of popularity, some people may make a claim of a self-oriented gospel that, hey, if you follow God, he is going to make you rich. And, and, and such, and all these gains are no good. Listen, we, we follow God because he not only created us, but he loves us. He died for us. He promised us heaven. But we're not the center of the, the whole deal. Yes, he loves us. He sent his son for us. But be careful of a self-centered gospel where God ends up not being the master but the servant to serve you. God has created you for relationship with him. And what a blessing it is to have that. He's the center, not me. Ministry is not a job. It's a calling. If it can support you financially, then great. But if it doesn't, will you still do it? We stay, still say, Lord, you know what? I'm going to follow you. Sometimes God will test the heart through that aspect. The, the finances aren't there. What am I going to do? Well, I'm just going to continue serving the Lord. It's a testing of the heart uh, and the calling. And are, are you only in it for a paycheck? Is it just what you do or who you are? I mean, when I, when I went to Bible college, this was 20-something years ago. When I came out, I was just so excited to do whatever I could to serve the Lord. And I, I, can't, I ended up finding a job. And I, I started at 6 in the morning, got off at 2, and then I just came down and just hung out at the church because that's where ministry was happening. And that's, I just wanted to be around it. So I'd hang out. What can I do? What can I do? Hey, here's a toilet wand. Go for it, man. All right, sweet. Let's do it. You know, here's a broom. Here's this. And, and just hanging out. And then the Bible studies. And it wasn't for like three years later that, that um, through a situation, I was actually able to come on, on staff. And I was just like, are you kidding me? 
And I cut back every expense because it was like, wow, I get to be, and, and I spend my time here at church, and this was like part-time. So I'm, I'm a single guy living on part-time wages going, I just can't believe I get to hang out at the house of God. This is great. And over the years, the Lord took that and developed it and obviously into a, a full-time position. But it's still that same heart that, you know what, if funds dried up and, and I had to go out and find a job, no problem, man. The ministry still goes on. It's God's work in various limitations might be, but that's just how it is. But these guys were in it. They were using ministry for gain. It was just all about a gain, whether it's all those things financially or whatever it might be. And Paul says to Tim, stay away from these people with wrong motives about money and ministry. Verse 6, he says the second thing, to be content with what God gives you. He says, now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. Be content. Contentment means to be completely self-sufficient. It's a frame of mind that is a independent of outward things. And it's so hard to do in a materialistic world, where marketing comes at you 24-7 since, hey, you are, not con you are not satisfied. You'll never be happy unless you buy our product and get our stuff. And of course we do, and we find out we're still miserable as it is. <laughs> it didn't work. It just numbed it maybe for a little bit. Will Rogers said this. He says, people spend money for what they don't have to buy things they don't need to impress people they don't care for. <laughs> so true. But God sees contentment as a key to success. And really there are three keys in these verses, six through eight, about being content as a Christian. Number one is the principle Godliness with contentment is great gain. See, men say godliness plus gain equals contentment. But God says, no, 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 you got it backwards. It's godliness with contentment that will equal great gain. Not just a gain, but great gain that's there. And that's this principle. The Bible tells us in Psalms 84 verse 11 that no good thing will God withhold from those who walk uprightly. And that is a wonderful thing that when my heart is right with God, in the first place, then I can be free to allow him to work in my life. It doesn't matter if I have a lot or if I have a little, I'm content. But when my heart isn't right with God, then what happens is, is I get irritated, I, I get agitated, I get bent out of shape with these things happening and, and wondering, where's the contentment? Where's the peace? Where's the rest? And the Lord's saying, you got to deal with the sin first. Get your heart right first and then watch what will happen. The value of godliness is greater, really, than we even truly know. 1 Timothy 4, 8, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So he lays out a plan in verse 6. He gives a perspective, another key of contentment in verse 7, that nothing goes with us when we die. I've yet to see in all the funerals I've done over the years a hearse following the funeral procession. You know, there's no U-Haul behind it going through with the stuff and, 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 you know, being buried. History tells us that King Charlemagne in, in 800 AD, when he was to be buried, he gave these instructions that I want you to put me in this tomb and I want you to put my, my marble throne there. I want to sit on it, put my royal robes on and my gold crown and a scepter in my hand and then put an edict that whoever opens this tomb will be cursed. And this was like 800. He was the, he was the king of France. A couple hundred years later, German King Otto, by the name, Otto III, came and uh, said, who cares about that, and ripped open the, the, the tomb. And there was the king, still there, on his throne, robed in royalty, golden crown on his head, a golden scepter in his hand, and his other hand was pointing, and there was, his, was a Bible in his lap. And his finger they had made to point right at Mark chapter 8, verse 36 which says, whoever has this world's goods and loses his soul, what does it profit him? You're not taking anything with you. And sometimes we, we lose that perspective and we need the Lord to remind us. Contentment is keeping an eternal perspective in a very temporary world. The third thing in verse 8 is that the key is the parameters that God sets. The contentment parameters start with the basics, food and clothing, the need for more and more really works against our hearts, and we got to live guarded lives. Listen to what Paul says, Philippians 4. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content wherever, 
whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in, in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And here's the secret. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. See, some people plaster that and say, that means I can do anything I set my mind to. That means I can dream high and I believe I can fly and all that other stuff that happens and I can do anything and God will back me up. No, no, no. The context is you can learn to be content and God will give you the strength to be content no matter where you're at and you can still have peace. Though you don't have that stuff or that issue or that thing. Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. You have his promise in his presence, his power, his plan. You've got everything in him. He is the all-sufficiency. And sometimes we have to remind our hearts because they get sideways. Our godliness with contentment is great gain. Let me strive for that. Beware of motives. Be content with what God's put in your hands. Look at verse 9 and 10. To be careful that covetousness destroys lives. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil from which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Wow, that's heavy. The word covet simply means to desire. The context always determines whether it's towards sin, which often it is, or whether it is towards something that's godly. So to desire to be rich can happen to whether you're rich already or poor, that covetousness can, can rise up and it blurs God's plan and perspective and, and principles that we just talked about. And he says you fall into temptation in a snare or like a trap. Driven by our lust to get, we end up drowning in either debt or the sin or whatever it is. I love what Psalm 62 verse 10 says. It says, if riches increase, do not set your heart on them. <laughs> it talks about they grow wings and they fly away. Empty pockets. We've all had them. But at the heart of this covetousness really is a love of money. And often money has motivated, in verse 10, some really evil things. When you start making you know, shady deals on the side because, man, I just got to make the money and that's okay. I don't need to adhere to you know, the principles of honesty and integrity. When you start pushing aside the, the, the godly priorities in your life and, well, I just need to make a buck. Well, I just need to, to do this. And, you know, sad to say, and I, I'm not one to say, you know what, Sunday has to be that holy day and you can never work on Sunday. That, that's not my prerogative. But what I've seen is, yeah, we need to honor the Lord. But I tell you, honestly, what I've seen people do is, man, when they start taking out Sunday and making the Lord that priority and the fellowship with people because they need to work, and they need to work, and they need to work, guess what happens? Time and time what I've seen is that goes like this with God until they're absolutely in a miserable place and they're going, what happened, pastor? So you allowed the money to get in the way. You started living for the dream rather than living for the man. And keep that priority that, Lord, you're first and foremost in my life. Whether it's, man, I, sometimes I have to work on Sunday. It's not a condemnation thing. If I can't work on Sunday, then, man, I want to find a small group or I want to make sure I'm, I'm solid in the word and I've got some people holding me accountable and I've got some brothers or sisters bearing me up and I'm still going to be in fellowship. But be careful. I've seen that trap happen too many times. You know, got to pay the bills, so I'm taking a second or third job. And yeah, you're paying the bills, but you're missing out on the presence of God because of those things captivate the heart. Sometimes the Lord allows the lack in our life for us to trust him and let him work a miracle and a testimony in the process. Be careful of covetousness. How many times we've wanted something so bad that it consumed us, and then when we got it, we were like, eh, that was empty. You see, God made you for a relationship with him. So nothing's going to satisfy until you cultivate that relationship with him. And then everything comes into perspective. 
You, know, there, you remember Jericho, the, 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 the walls fell down and stuff. Before they went into Jericho, uh, God gave Joshua an edict and told the people, I want you to dedicate the very first fruits of everything. You've just entered into the land. Give everything to me. And so they went in and the walls fell down and everybody's having a happy hallelujah moment and everything's really rolling good. And then the next day they find out well, we're going to take the next town and, well, we just need to take a few people and they send a few people and they get defeated. What is going on? And the Lord says there's sin in the camp. So Joshua does kind of a roll call and, and the Lord narrows it down to this one man. His name's Achan and his family. He says, what did you do? He says, well, you know, when we went in, I, I saw these things and I saw these garments and these, these silver and this bag of gold and I just took it and I hid it in my tent. I hid it, and it's buried in my tent, and the covetousness was controlling his life, and, and as a result, what happened is he was stoned to death. He paid a heavy price because of the covetousness. I can think about that story. I think, you know, you buried it in your tent. What happens when you move? You got to dig another hole. Every place you move, you got to dig another hole. You constantly live the rest of your life trying to cover over your sin that no one would find out what's really in your heart. But here's the beautiful thing, gang. When you live open before the Lord and say, God, I don't want covetousness to, guard, to rip me off. I want to live free before you. I, I want to live in the victory and the peace and the joy. I want to prize you most of all and not this love of money thing going on. Lord, it's just, a, it's just a tool to use, but don't let it grip me that way. Then guess what? Life becomes a joy. And the peace passes understanding, guards our hearts. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. So is it wrong to have money? Is it more godly to be poor? No. Look at the fourth thing as we skip down to verse 17 and 19. 17 to 19. He says to be wise and minister through the money if you have it. Command which is, is not a suggestion, it's a command that riches can sometimes think we're better off than others or we're immune from problems. He says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Guard your heart, Paul says. He's give, God's given you a portion to manage. Manage it well. But guard your heart because riches are uncertain. You know, they're here today and gone tomorrow. And we've all seen that. It doesn't take long to figure that out. What does last and is certain is the Lord and the true riches that we'll look at in just a second. But this is something I think we need to teach our kids often. Money isn't the goal of life. It's not the goal of life. It's what the internet and, and what Hollywood will tell you. But it isn't. There's so much more value in life especially with God, that go beyond the realm of money. Look at verse 18 and 19. He says, Let them do good that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And, and really for the believer, the riches become the tool for doing good and ministering to others. Yes, you need to care for your family. And then looking at sharing and caring for others and those needs. You become a blessing to others. You, in a sense, are paying it forward in an eternal reward. I have told many of you this, but when we went to China, we sold off everything and went over there with spoons and forks. No, we didn't even have those. We, had, <laughs> we went over there with you know, the shirt on our back type of thing. And we had to buy everything that we, when we were there and furnished an apartment and stuff. But when, we, when God had called us home, it was such a, a cool moment for us to begin to give away everything from the refrigerator to somebody who didn't even have a fridge to a bed, somebody who slept on the floor, which was normal for them. And, and, and just to start kind of give it all away. It was, oh, it was wonderful. It was great. Give it all away. You can't take it on a plane, so you might as well have fun giving it away to people getting on a plane, coming back home, and, and we ended up living in a house where, where somebody had actually given us to stay in their house, and they left it fully furnished and everything when they moved to Florida. And, and this was like a, a mansion house, a huge house and all this stuff. And I was like, I'm not living in a house this big when we finally get on our feet. We got a lot of stuff. So let's just start giving more stuff away <laughs> and started funneling it out. And hey, anybody need this and that? And 
it was really, a, what a blessing to just be that instrument of, of giving out to people um, as unto the Lord to help meet needs. And the Lord may have times in your life to do that. Proverbs 11.25 says, The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. As you bless others, you become uh, blessed yourself. So in your home, manage money well, but remind yourself that those under you, uh, that there are greater riches to pursue in life than money. And what those are, look at verse 11 through 16 as we run through this. He says to Timothy, but you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. After warning Timothy about the problems with money in verse 10, Paul reminds him of this wonderful thing of God that are worth pursuing, the true riches. And the first thing that I would tell you that's worth pursuing or valuing higher than anything on this earth is his work in you. The character that God develops in you is not something that happens overnight. It takes time. It takes work. It's sometimes a forging process for that, that character like gold to shine forth. It is valued more than the riches of this earth. A godly character is a point of being truly rich. You know, don't be bummed out if you didn't win the lottery. If God's working in your heart, you're, you're a rich man. You're on the right track. If you let God work, he'll do his work. And, and you remember this, that the, the gold that we value here on earth is just asphalt in heaven. <laughs> the streets are paved with it. His work in you. He's not given up. Number two, look at his word to you in verse 12. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. He says, Timothy, fight this fight of faith. Lay hold. You're going against the flow. You're, you're choosing to follow God's ways. And there's going to be some kickback. There's going to be some pressure. It's going to get tough. And like a soldier, you need to bear down and you need to keep going forward. You need to lay hold on that victory and never let it go. As if you prize and value this the most, it's cost you a little blood, sweat, and tears in the process. And what's he talking about? The eternal life. Fight the good fight and lay hold of eternal life. That it's priceless. Hey, listen, do you value your salvation as greater than anything this world could offer? Oh, it's priceless. I am truly a rich man in the Lord's eyes because I'm saved. And that alone is, sets me in eternity's field. He says at the end of verse 12, Tim, you've not only been called by God to greater things, yet remember you also chose to volunteer for this. You've confessed your faith as true in front of others. You've told them all, you're all in, and so let the salvation that you have in hand be worked out in your life. The true riches are his work in you, his word to you. Number three in verse 13 and 14, his will for you. He says that you keep this commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ's appearing which he will manifest in his own time. He was the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. So his will for you, he says in verse 13 and 14, is to be faithful to the end. Keep this commandment for godly living until Christ comes. Why? Well, quite simply, in verse 13, he, he says, your creator is watching in the sight of God who gives life to all things. Nothing escapes his eyes. And this is not your creator is watching you. When you step out of line, he's going to bonk you on the head. This is not way, in any way condemning. It's actually comforting. I can persevere and keep going forward and, and know that I'm walking in his will and he sees exactly where I'm at and he sees exactly what's ahead and I can rest in him. My creator is watching me. But not only that, I'm walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Verse 13. Here is one who stayed steady before Pontius Pilate in his confession as he confessed the truth and he confessed the kingdom and the sovereignty of God and, and he even stayed steady until his death. And guess what? You and I follow in the very same footsteps of the Lord. His will for your life, the path before you, the Lord sees ahead what you're going to face and has already said, I'm going to be with you in that. I'm watching 
and you're walking in the footsteps of Jesus. So value the work that he's doing in you, the will that he has for you, and the word that he's given to you. Value those things. And lastly, the worth that we find in Jesus, verse 15 and 16. Paul reminds Timothy that knowing and loving Jesus is the key for success. That the person who has Jesus is, is the richest man. He is the only blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, that he holds that highest position. He's powerful. He's immortal with no end. Unapproachable means that he's separate from us. He's holy. And all the honor and power are his. And he gives a hearty amen. All that deserves that humble worship and the amen. And I think Paul's point in all laying this out is this, is that if we're connected to the one who owns it all and reigns forever, are we not the richest people who ever lived? We are. The problem is our eyesight. We get our eyes off of the Lord and we get our eyes off of all he's done for us and we start looking at the temporary things and thinking, well, that's, that's what I need to truly be content. And the Lord says, no, you have your contentment in me. You just need to settle down and enjoy it. Why trade the true riches in God for temporary ones on earth? And knowing who Jesus is and what he has done and what is ahead for us really becomes the backbone for us being content. One last thing in verses 20 and 21. He says, oh, Timothy. This is like a father to a son. Oh, Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what's falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Paul's last charge to Timothy in this letter is just kind of a subtle reminder to steady on. Guard what you know to be true from God about his word and be careful of all the idle and, and babblings and, and the falsities that come from men. You see, there's always a temptation, whether you are a parent or a pastor or whatever it might be in your house, to stray away from those things that God has called you to do. How do you say steady? in the midst of all the storms and not shipwreck your faith? How do you lead your family and govern your house well through those things? Well, take note of verse 21, very last few words. Grace be with you. I love that. Because there's the balance to it all. As we look at it, it's not just about rules. It's not about setting forth these rules. It's about allowing the grace of God to change you, to set you on new courses. The grace of God, may it be with you as you go forward even out from here and as you work your day and you handle that money and you manage it, may God give you grace that your heart would be soft towards him, your mind open to his word and his will and going forward with him.